Hello, um, I'm Helen Gregory, curator of Macintosh Gallery here at Western University in London, Ontario. Uh, welcome tonight to tonight's panel discussion for the exhibition, The Life Cycle of Celestial Objects, Parts 1 and 2, currently showing at Macintosh Gallery until December 9th. This panel discussion is co-presented with the Department of Visual Arts Art Now speaker series. So welcome to all the students who are involved or who are enrolled in Art Now and to their instructor, Liza Urich, uh, as well as to everyone else who's joining us from elsewhere. Uh, participating in tonight's panel uh, are my co-curator, Joel Ong, as well as several of the artists included in the exhibition, uh, Peter Morin and Tanya Willard, speaking on behalf of Bush Gallery, Bettina Forge, uh, Jesse Tungalik, and Camille Turner. Uh, so before I start tonight's discussion, uh, I'd like to acknowledge that Western University is located on the traditional lands of the Anishinaabek, Haudenosaunee, Lunapawak, and Chinonkton nations, on lands connected with the London Township and Somber Treaties of 17, 1796 and the Dish with One Spoon Covenant Wampum. With this, we respect the long-standing relationships that Indigenous nations have to this land, as they are the original caretakers. We acknowledge historical and ongoing injustices that Indigenous peoples, First Nations, Métis, and Inuit endure in Canada, and we accept responsibility as a public institution to contribute towards revealing and correcting miseducation, as well as renewing respectful relationships with Indigenous communities through our teaching, research, and community service. The life cycle of celestial objects, parts one and two, is, as the title suggests, uh, an exhibition in two parts, spread over Macintosh Gallery's two exhibition spaces. In the East Gallery is a multimedia techno-scientific installation curated slash created by Joel Ong in collaboration with the York University Satellite Lab run by Professor Regina Lee with the input of a group of graduate students in media arts and engineering. In the West Gallery, I've curated an exhibition of contemporary Canadian art, which includes the, uh, the artists who we have here tonight, uh, as well as Shuvanaya Shuna, Nuriel Stern, and Nancy Jo Collin, and Janet Jones. Collectively, the two exhibitions consider the role of wonder as a motivating force behind exploration, but they also examine the more problematic aspects that have grown out of this curiosity about the cosmos, from the legacy of abandoned space junk that orbits the Earth to the historic exclusion of voices in terms of who has participated in exploring beyond our terrestrial boundaries. So with that in mind, I have invited Joel and several of the artists to participate in a discussion of their work with the offered prompt of considering what it might mean to them to decolonize space. And again, um, so this is an offered prompt and the artists are free to take it up as much as they please. Uh, in the interest of keeping things running fairly efficiently, um, I plan to keep my own comments to a minimum between speakers, um, and then we're going to open up the floor to questions from the audience at the end. Uh, and I, I, I encourage the audience to type your questions into the Q&A box, although I believe that Josh also has the, uh, he also has the chat function running. It looks like you're all happily chat chatting already. Um, yeah, so I, I, you know, I, I want to encourage the panelists as well to ask each other questions and to engage in conversation as much as this platform allows. So first of all, uh, I do see that Joel has successfully managed to uh, get to York. Um, and I think we're going to start with, we're going to start with <laughs> Joel as I, had, as I had originally planned. So I'm just going to introduce Joel. Uh, Joel Ong is a media artist whose works connect scientific and artistic approaches to the environment. His recent works explore the visibility and audibility of ambient phenomena with a particular focus on the wind and the atmospheric microbiome. He has presented his work internationally at venues including Ectopia Gallery in Lisbon, El Museo Cultural, uh, Cultural de Santa Fe in New Mexico, the Seattle Art Museum, the National Museum of China in Beijing, and he's currently working on a commission for UCLA as part of the Getty's PST Art, Art and Science Collide project. Joel is an alumnus of Symbiotica, the Center of Excellence in Biological Arts uh, in Perth, Western Australia, 
and he holds a PhD from GX Arts at the University of Washington. He was the recipient of the Petro Canada Young Innovators Award in 2020, uh, and he was the former director of Sensorium, the Center of Digital Arts and Technology, which is at York. He is Associate Professor in Computational Arts and the Helen Carswell Chair in Community Engaged Research uh, in the Arts at York. So as I mentioned, uh, Joel worked with the York University Satellite Lab to create a multimedia installation. Uh, Joel, I've got like a little sort of, um, not exactly a bio for the lab, but I got a little description of the lab. Is it okay with you if I just sort of read through that or would you prefer to talk about it yourself? No, go for it. I think that's a great idea. Okay, great. Okay, so for those who are not aware of it, uh, the Nano Satellite Research Lab is part of the Earth and Space um, Science and Engineering Department at York University. Led by Professor Regina Lee, a strong advocate for gender equality and diverse systems of knowledge in the engineering fields, the group's research centers on improved power generation and distribution for next generation satellite technology, ultra precise attitude determination, is that attitude or altitude? Attitude? Attitude determination and control and microphonic, oh, sorry, microphotonic payloads for small satellites. Increasingly, her work has uh, taken the lab towards innovative scientific presentations and community science communication activities, including talks at the Ontario Science Center, as well as creative works around the CSA Stratus balloon launch in Timmins, which was in August of uh, 2023, which is featured in this exhibition. Since 2021, the lab has been working with faculty and students from the School of Arts, Media, Performance, and Design on maximizing interdisciplinary expertise. So I'm going to put it over to you, Joel. Um, are you ready to go? <laughs> Pretty much, yeah. How, you, um, I don't know if you want to share a screen or not. It's up to you. No, no. I'm just I'm just going to read what I have and, and uh, maybe talk and then um and then go from there um how much time do we have um you can have say like 15 yeah. minutes something like that okay okay all right guys um thank you so much for having me and uh thank you so much for that introduction uh helen uh really i, I think this was an, an amazing uh opportunity um to put a milestone in this collaboration that has been going on for about um about three to four years uh, now um, over the pandemic. Uh, and it's been officiated most recently um, through a SHRC NFRF grant, which I wrote with Regina. Uh, and, uh, you know, so here, and I would just like to say that this project has been funded uh, in part by the Social Sciences, uh, the, the Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council of Canada. Um, so uh, again, you know, this, this has been a really amazing collaborative process, um, you know, first off of curating and, and working together with, with Helen and the staff uh, at McIntosh. So I'm really, really grateful for that. Um, but, you know, just kind of probing deeper into some of the earliest uh, um, uh, hints of collaboration. Uh, Regina Lee is a is engineer, true and true. Uh, and, uh, you know, from the start, she's been doing that. Um, she, she comes from a family of engineers. Uh, we've met her children and her children sit around a dinner table and kind of talk about it, being engineers when they grow up. And I'm like, are you sure you want, <laughs> you want to go in that direction? Um, but uh, she is one of those um, uh, people who have such an expansive uh, perception of uh, of knowledge, uh, and I've been so uh, gratified to be able to to have these conversations with her about how knowledge is is created, how knowledge is shared, uh, and and most importantly, I think what forms these knowledges take, uh, and who gets access to them. So, in a sense, this exhibition has really been an exploration of what it means to develop a participatory model uh, of space exploration. Um, this is a mode of operating uh, that's very actually very common in the arts. Uh, you know, anyone who's um, you know developed a photograph, for instance, would know that there are so many different stages, and at each stage, you know, there are many different people and many different tools uh, and many different uh, um, histories, archaeological, you know, media, archaeologically, <laughs> archaeological histories uh, that come to play uh, all at once. Um, 
and perhaps that's not as apparent, you know, in the science and engineering departments and, and even less common uh, in the space sciences where you would consider this to be one of the most forefront uh, of, um, of, of, of the sciences and engineering uh, and where, uh, you know, the, the slightest hints of error uh, could cause really catastrophic effects. And so, you know, it almost seems like you have to have a certain caliber before you step into these shrines, so to speak. Um, and it's so it's it's incredibly uncommon uh, to see in the space sciences, uh, in the, you know, to to see um, researchers who are actually interested in in trying to bridge the arts, uh, or even as Regina has done to incorporate artists and aesthetic considerations into their research. Um, I will say that this is changing, uh, and with you know the the burgeoning feel of, of of visualization and sonification as well, and you know with all these beautiful images that we are getting, uh, people are starting to realize that the sharing of these images from such as you know the James Webb, for instance, uh, or the Hubble uh, telescope uh, before that, uh, these are all an art and a science. You know, there's a lot of uh, things that go into uh, creating the colors. Uh, and the images that you see um, that are uh, sometimes uh, more artistically charged than they are scientific. Um, so before satellites, uh, you know, SpaceX, CSA, or NASA, um, celestial bodies existed in very different forms. Uh, they were they were part of folklore. They were part of collective imagining, uh, with an emphasis on the communication of these stories and these shared experiences uh, of the twinkling iridescent night sky. You know, if you just think back, uh, this is one of the exercises that we did first First off with Regina's lab, which just think back, you know, before we started thinking about the, the physical equations that would govern the way that a satellite would leave the Earth or, or how it would return to Earth, you know, as SpaceX has been trying to do uh, successfully, thankfully, um, how, what was the first experience? What was the first sensorial experience of the night sky that you had? You know, and if you just think back about that, um, what were the conditions that uh, that that you experienced that day? What was the weather like? Was it loud? You know, were there many people around you? And who were these people? Were they talking? Were you sharing stories? What were these stories? And what moment of your life were you in when you had those things? Uh, when when you had that experience? Um, and you know, with Regina's lab as an, an example, you know, we started to think and started to pry apart. Um, the reasons or the motivations for uh, for for getting into space exploration in the first place, you know, this this kind of seeking, uh, so to speak, of of wonder, of mystery, of what was out there. Um, you know, there's this amazing quote that that Sarah Gallagher uh, has, a Western uh, space scientist who who we interviewed for for this uh, this 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 project. Um, about the the way that she studies supermassive black holes, and that's something that you can never actually uh, realize, or you never actually experience it in the flesh, uh, because they're just so far away, uh, they're just so big, um, or they're just so mysterious that you're just uh, left with abstractions uh, or simulacrums of them. Uh, and so, you know, this idea of just constantly trying to understand this, uh, you know, moving forward. Uh, and and you know thinking about the first time where that spark was actually lit. So as you know, um, our skies today team with these communication satellites, there's a lot of space junk. There's a lot of other forms of um, resident space objects. So RSOs feature very prominently uh, nowadays. You know, you look up in the night sky and you see sometimes there's a lot of things that are moving. Uh, and uh, how might we envision a future of, of uh, so so one of the questions in the exhibition was how might we envision a future of exploration that builds on these growing awarenesses and public consciousnesses of space and space travel uh, to become something that includes or considers diverse viewpoints and access both to the data and the motivations of space science. So in the video that we, uh, that one of the videos that we showed, uh, it was called a participatory consciousness to the skies, celestial ob objects, observations, and origins. Uh, we wanted to ask space scientists uh, what their personal motivations were for their research. Uh, and also for them to propose, like what would this participatory model uh, look like? So for uh, Western professor Yan Kami, for instance, it's this realization that the carbon in our bodies 
uh, are produced through dying stars that existed billions of miles away. So, you know, the carbon that made your right hand could be very different, it could be from a different dying star uh, than the carbon that made your left hand. They could be, you know, billions of miles apart. And that is quite a profound thought if you think about it. Um, and for uh, Dr. Tony Perrin uh, at the CSA, uh, it's to realize that actually space science is not really for only for engineers. Uh, it's a very, very huge multidisciplinary uh, endeavor that includes, um, you know, um, um, scientists, that includes business people, that includes artists, uh, that includes um, um, communicators, uh, people who are good with uh, administrative work, uh, but also it includes uh, the next generation. And this is something that, you know, you would come across, you know, when you start thinking about space science and when you start thinking about getting into space science, which is, you know, what is the position of the amateur uh, within these fields? Um, and, uh, you know, unfortunately, the young kind of get relegated a lot to that, that space. Uh, and so it was really heartwarming for me to realize that Regina Lee uh, when she's running her nanosatellite lab that's sending these things routinely up into orbit, um, she sees the lab as a family. Uh, and she really sees her, uh, her students past and present as her children, as her friends, as her collaborators, uh, and she really keeps in touch with them. So in the most recent trip that we made to Montreal to uh, to to visit the Canadian Space Agency, uh, she we actually had lunch with uh, four of her ex-students. And it was it was a great it was a great event, you know, because we were able to talk about space science, but we could even get even uh, uh, beyond that and start to think about what the relational aspects of um, you know um, space exploration are, uh, you know, and, and and that kind of things. Um, <clears throat> so uh, I, I will say a little bit at this point about Regina and her team. Um, I think they are they are relentless. <laughs> they're very motivated, uh, and they're also incredibly talented. Um, uh, they have an incredible track record, as I mentioned before, of, of missions and launches in the past, you know, 15 plus years. Uh, and the latest one is actually this balloon launch uh, run by the CSA called the Stratus uh, Balloon Mission, uh, where they, they, they send up a payload that's about the size of a truck. Uh, and they have an open call uh, for institutions around Canada, or around the world, actually, uh, to almost like rent spaces on that payload. Uh, and they're able to put their scientific instruments on it. Uh, and what the balloon does, it goes into low orbit uh, for about um, 14 hours, and then it comes back down. Um, so it's not uh, like uh, in communication satellites that kind of go up in space and then they orbit the Earth for, for, an, for a pretty long duration of time, uh, but they actually go up and they come back down. So, so you know, she's, she's been thinking a lot about these space junk uh, congestion issues, and, and uh, this is one strategy uh, that her lab is using to to kind of mitigate that. Um, so she uh, she has been engaging a lot with communities outside uh, the shrines of space science as well. And and one of the examples that we feature in the exhibition uh, is this uh, presentation that her lab did at the Ontario Science Center uh, in March break earlier this year. Uh, that was about teaching visitors uh, the growing issues of space junk. Uh, but also encouraging uh, a sense of wonder and play around the skies. Uh, and she had this uh, idea of having kids write messages um, and, uh, you know, to say like, oh, what would you like to say to, to space? And then we engraved it on the bottom of one of the interface plates uh, that connected the payload, her payload to the larger payload. Uh, and then uh, we sent it up on the balloon and then it was returned to Earth. So this, this interface plate is actually on display at, at the uh, Magnetarch as well. So there were there were some interesting questions like um, uh, how's the weather up there? Uh, how's it like to float in space? Uh, you know, up in space is there among us? Like, uh, and even there was a person who put in a joke. You know, uh, which is how how do you hold a party in space? And I'll tell you the answer at the end of my my talk. <clears throat> so so when we first started out collaboration, Regina and I invited um, her students, as I mentioned, to write uh, these little haikus about their first moment of awareness of space, uh, you know, the full sensorial emotional experience of it, who they were with or what they were thinking. And so the wall installation that Helen alluded to at the start, this very techno-scientific idea, uh, is entitled Interactive Circuit Board Graveyard, but it really seeks to recreate 
uh, this moment um, or the first experience of that space. Um, so there's a couple of constellations in there. Uh, there is a vinyl cutout of um, the, the great bear uh, and the little bear with the Ursa major and minor constellations uh, and some other things. But they're also populated with these circuit boards uh, that were collected from uh, decommissioned uh, satellite missions. Uh, and these are the IRIS mission, Descent mission, Sigma mission, uh, Manitoba Sat mission, and Essence uh, satellite missions. Um, and so they kind of populate the night sky and they have LEDs on them. Uh, and users are invited to kind of move these red plugs around so you can turn on and off the LEDs to, to kind of simulate the blinking of stars at night. Uh, and so, you know, it really raises the question, uh, number one, of like where satellites go when they're decommissioned, but it also th it makes us think a little bit about the, the shape or the aesthetic form of the night sky now uh, that is teeming with these, um, you know, natural entities, but also very techno-scientific ones. Um, so uh, I would also credit at this point, you know, the two very incredibly talented artists, uh, Kieran Mirage and Grace Grothaus, who did the sonification and visualization respectively for the wall. Uh, and, um, you know, the, and, and um, they have been a, a really uh, deep collaborator uh, in terms of considering data aesthetics as a parallel mode uh, of reading and communicating information. Uh, so, I, at this point, I think I will uh, I will I will stop here um, and I will hand the time over to the next speaker. But uh, thank you very much for your attention, everyone, uh, and I look forward to your questions later. Thanks, Joel. Um, yeah. So before we move on to the next speaker, I just want to say, yeah, the the circuit board graveyard is it's um it is a, it's a, it's quite a gorgeous experience for people when they go in because they go into the gallery. It's very dark. The the sort of the, the fall the far wall is painted this very dark like purple black. Uh, there's a constellation of the Ursa Major and Minor. There's like little little stars, and then there's the the circuit boards, which you know have these lights that illuminate. So like it really does have this incredible kind of like celestial um, feeling when you walk in. I mean, you know, we watch people go in and experience it for the first time. And there's actually usually like a, a quite an, an audible, um, you know, expression <laughs> when they open the door. It's, it's, it is actually quite wondrous. So um, next, I'm going to turn it over to Bush Gallery. So we have Peter Morin and Tanya Willard here. Um, so in lieu of a bio, um, I'd like to read an excerpt from Bush Gallery's manifesto. Um, Bush Gallery, which consists of Gabrielle Lerondel Hill, Peter Morin, and Tanya Willard, is a space for dialogue, experimental practice, and community-engaged work that contributes to an understanding of how gallery systems and art mediums might be transfigured, translated, and transformed by Indigenous knowledges traditions, aesthetics, performance, and land use systems. This model of decolonial non-institutional ways to engage with and value indigenous knowledge and indigenous creative production is at the heart of Bush Gallery. Bush Gallery is a trans-conceptual gallery space. To be trans-conceptual is to reposition ideas within indigenous and Western epistemological conditions. A transconceptual space requires your body to be in a constant state of flux, never settling, like the flow of water in a river. One of the goals of Bush Gallery is to articulate indigenous creative land practices, which are born out of a lived connection to the land. This gallery is out on the land. It is outside of, or at the margins of, monetary systems and away from the colonized space of art institutions. This gallery is a gallery of the land, of indigenous cultures and languages. This gallery can show new media with basketry, beading with installation art, performance art, and storytelling. Bush Gallery is located on the sovereign uh, Sukwepmuk territory. Bush Gallery is Tanya Willard's home, and participation comes with invitation. So over to you, Tanya and Peter. Sorry, thank you for that introduction. And uh, Peter and I are going to share um, 
some images and some conversation. Just give me one second to set this up. Oops. Uh, so I might uh, show you the thumbnails as well as the full screen here. Um, Peter, you'll know this uh, this album, this work of Gil Scott Heron. But we're going to start out, Peter. I'm going to I'm going to ask you a question. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Um, why did the white man go to the moon? I don't know why. Well, he heard the Indians had land up there. <laughs> <laughs> that one's a classic. <laughs> <laughs> and and what it reveals and i'm showing this image of gil scott heron what it reveals is the inequity uh the you know the social construct and the colonial impulse of outer space and gil scott heron said this really beautifully when he you know he has his work um but whitey on the moon and his album cover here whitey on the moon and he says i can't pay no dr bill but Whitey's on the moon. Uh, and I think this contrast of access and uh, racism and colonization is still such a huge part of the conversation of um, space exploration. Uh, I'm going to have a few citations through here, Peter, and you can mm -hmm. um, interject. Um, I was reading, a, uh, thinking about this, thinking through Gil Scott Heron and this joke. I was also reading a transcript of a Native American scholars um, uh, symposium that took place in 1970. And this transcript um, attributed through Jeanette Henry, um, and it was the first convocation of American Indian scholars. Uh, and in that, they say this statement. Pity the Indians and the buffalo of outer space. Wow. You know, quite clearly there in 1970, we're talking about the same kinds of issues of, you know, people uh, are seeing the relationship between colonization in their experience as, you know, as Indigenous peoples in the Americas and space exploration. So we can, you know, we're aware that that colonial nature, the new frontier is very much a space of continued colonization. Yeah, but, yeah, yeah, and and also the the kind of very there's also these new tangible examples of that as well with the Jeff Bezos space rocket uh, and the uh, the other two that just recently crested themselves into outer space for a price ticket of two hundred and fifty thousand dollars per per seat. You know, while people on the earth are starving, I still can't, I still can't kind of like rec rectify that in my mind. Yeah. Like, mm -hmm. yeah. I'm not sure we can rush. I mean, that's the question here is who can rationalize that injustice? Um, you know, the positing of a future for ourselves as Indigenous people, for um, racialized people is a radical act, thinking of ourselves in the future. Um, and uh, that is also importantly connected to our past. And so I just wanted to also cite these other kinds of important conversations that um, that are happening also in the 70s, right? So to connect kind of the archive of Gil Scott Heron and Simon Ortiz, poet, Acoma, Indigenous poet Simon Ortiz, and his story, Men on the Moon, it's a collection of stories. And just to link like that this conversation is ongoing intergenerationally, uh, that, you know, we have, as Indigenous peoples, we have well, some of us have treaty, right? Um, mm -hmm. In British Columbia, we're in unceded territories. And so we're often talking about these ideas of treaty. And so, you know, there's this outer space treaty as well. Um, and why doesn't that, you know, is that a treaty that is in some ways um, important for us to intervene in, in terms of the same kinds of issues on land rights um, that we see are are not upheld in Canada? So, can we recontextualize treaties in this idea of interplanetary agreements and outer space law to redefine who the alien is? Yeah, and it, and it also, you know, this this piece too, uh, which returns us to our bodies as well. Like, you know, in order to have that that mo moment of like outer space treaty, we have to acknowledge the power of indigenous bodies and multiple bodies of of uh, diverse ancestry, 
countries connected to these territories we know as earth and you know? treaty as a relationship so not maybe as the document even here as the outer as the outer space treaty as a a document but it's also in that treaty it's also symbolic um of relations but i i think this is an interesting thing to point out is the patterns of colonization evident in outer space exploration and here we're showing a sunny asu work um the title of this work is they're coming quick i have a better hiding place for you dorvan the fifth you'll love it and it's um sunny asu's work and he's particularly setting up uh this is a work from 2015 setting up his reference of the Star Trek canon and uh, popular culture with referencing an episode of Star Trek The Next Generation where Captain Picard and his crew encounter Native Americans who in Star Trek's fictional past left Earth for a new planet and Picard wrestles with the decision to displace them yet again. At the end of the episode, the Native leaders, uh, having refused to move in accordance with the Federation Agreement affecting their planet, are victorious good that's a good episode and stay <laughs> on their new home planet and they successfully and diplomatically defend their interplanetary land and um i wanted to show these images and and some of the text i'm referencing comes from a text i developed for sunny's um, exhibition of these works where he intervenes on uh, a lot of emily carr and other kind of classical canadian uh, western landscapes um tradition uh, and he he uses these ovoids as these interplanetary travelers. Uh, and the title of this work was called Decolonize Mars. So I'm kind of resurfacing it. Um, we'll also talk about uh, our work, Peter, in the exhibition. Mm -hmm. But I wanted to propose these um, these images as also a kind of decolonial terraforming of the land. And terraforming is a process of making like uh, you know, extraterrestrial planets habitable for human life, but also can we think about that as, uh, you know, as how we might um, decolonially terraform here on Earth to restore wild waters, wild salmon, wild game, and wild hearts to this planet. Mm -hmm. And and also the more than human beings, the more than human beings need to be included at all levels of this, uh, including if we're terraforming like that action of making a, another planet hospitable for human bodies, but not necessarily for the more than human. And really a, like space exploration is such a human centric activity. So mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Another question for us, um, Peter, you, where I'm showing an image of the original gold record from the Voyager oh, sounds of I, earth. It's uh, it's uh -huh. underneath, it's underneath the text. Yeah, I was just going to say, uh, Tanya, oh. I just want to uh, oh. alert you to the fact okay. that your, uh, your notes are Okay, the well, there you go. You can read along, but here we go. Are you seeing the image of the record now? Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. Perfect, perfect. There we go. So, Peter, I thought you might touch on this as a reference point for um, the work that we have. And the next image is the work that we have in the exhibition. Yeah, so a part of a part of a recent Bush Gallery uh, uh, residency uh, we took that took place at the uh, Odette residency. Uh, one of the things that we were uh, thinking about offering to the residency and to this residency in particular was fantastic because it also included working with students and and students helping in the production of the work. Uh, uh, at York York University, and we proposed uh, to make. Bush Gallery satellites, uh, thinking about how we would speak back to the star people. And this, this there's all these sort of elements here too, of like indigenous futurists, as well as all of the incredible work that Afrofuturists have offered to us uh, in thinking and, and, and um, helping us to imagine a kind of freedom that uh, is uh, without oppression, you know? Uh, and this, kind of starts with a kind of a return to uh, this gold record, which was uh, sent up in that, I can't remember the name of the satellite now. It, well, it's Voyager and it's from the Vo 70s yeah. as well and is now left our solar system. Yeah, which is so incredible, right? And, and you know, there there's also these other kind of interesting uh, complications, right? Because where does the gold come from? to make this album, 
right? Uh, it comes from indigenous territories and probably was removed from indigenous territories without ethical considerations or relational experience, uh, relational ways of being. And uh, actually this record, you can find a full listing. I can pop it in the chat of the track list. Um, there's two records that were produced um, for the Voyager, a number of recordings from Alan Lomax. So they actually do, um, you know, the idea was they pre present a diversity of human culture on the record. It, it is predominantly Western culture, settler culture. Um, but there are some uh, recordings from Solomon Islands, indigenous folks, as well as um, Navajo uh, on this record. And uh, of course, Peter, it informed our work in the exhibition. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So what you're seeing in front of you is uh, one component piece of a uh, larger installation work. Um, we settled for the exhibition, we settled on, on this drum. The drum skin was offered to us by an incredible two-spirit uh, Métis uh, maker named uh, on Instagram, Hunter Trapper, right? Yeah, Hunter Casca Cascanet, and this is a walnut dyed um, deer hide, which also supports their resurgent activity in learning hide tanning. And what happened there, what happens here is that the, the skin itself turns into, it turns into a like space, it turns into solar system, you know? Uh, and it also is, you know, some drum makers, I'm, you know, I've been trained as a drum maker from folks like Laura Hines, uh, Dolores Dallas, uh, Brenda Crabtree, um, David Rattree, or, and some drum makers will tell you not to make drums with holes in it. Uh, but because we were speaking back to uh, this process of expanding, expanding our Bush Gallery reach back upwards into space, the holes also became a part of uh, honoring the animal, honoring uh, hunter trappers, uh, hard work making the skin for us. Um, and the and process of learning, I think, like, you know, that we're, that there's not um, perfection, there is process mm -hmm. and, and knowledge within that. And it really, when you, when you decided to illuminate this drum, it really also related it even more to like this um, planetary kind of celestial image that is still also heartbeat and womb. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. What, and, and the piece about the piece about how our bodies like the the deer hide that lent its body to this also is making the sounds of the earth the wood that is uh, the drum hoop uh, where the skin is stretched around to make the resonance chamber for sound is also like can holds and makes sounds of the earth. And I guess uh, finally for me, uh, at, or for, our, for our conversation, um, thinking about how do we return messages to the star people who uh, joined us here, joined many indigenous nations here. There's uh, like uh, Nehiao people talk about and have many good stories about star people, you know, uh, joining being here, being present, you know? How do we return a sound to them, which is uh, also saying, we're still here, we're still alive. Absolutely. I'm just throwing those images again in case mine were not coming across. And then we have a short, very short video of what the work looks like in the gallery. I'm just gonna bring that up. And uh -huh. I see. Just one sec. And I just want us to sit with that idea of, of bodily, of resurgent practice, of technology that's not only digitized and electronic, but that is also remembered, that is felt, that is connected. Uh, we had a lot of um, participants when we, so we made that at the Odette Residency, uh, York University. Uh, and we had a number of people who collaborated with us. And there was also this relationship with, you know, this body. Um, and we also talk about bodies in planetary ways. 
Uh, and, and so, yeah, Peter, I know you talked about the drama as a messenger and a satellite, and perhaps it's also a, a call to action in a way, in terms of this idea of, can we decolonize this sense of exploration um, as it is also um, beginning? Can that process of untangling, you know, it, it, to me, it's a really necessary and urgent process um, at the outset. 100%. Seek balance. And that and that wholeness of, of which, you know, you got to work for balance, right? <laughs> it requires work. <laughs> and even if we're in space, we still need to figure out what balance looks like. There's the um, colloquialism that like uh, when NASA and SpaceX were on Navajo reservation land um, and they were talking about the landing on the moon or the way that Simon Ortiz talks about, um, in his case, this elder who gets a TV and simultaneously experiences um, broadcast television and the landing on the moon is this sense of, oh, uh, okay, you guys are only getting there now. We've been traveling there in kind of more spiritual ways for a long time. Um, and I think uh, I'll let you, if you want to add any concluding statements here, Peter, but I think that we'd better start the decolonization of Mars and space right now, because it's already taken a very long time here on Earth. And with that, Bush Gallery has recently purchased decolonizemars.com domain. <laughs> Nothing is there yet. But I think like even the sense of, you know, domain names, there's a lot of them out there. And um, that that is not one that's uh, taken yet. Um, and we're going to carry that mantle a little bit to think about it. So also, we maybe should presence that by saying we've long worked with the idea of Mars as the red planet, as a planet mm -hmm. for the red nation. And uh, and so um, we purchased that domain today at decolonizemars.com and might have some further threads and thoughts. <laughs> That's perfect. That's perfect. <laughs> Thank you. Thank for the, you. And we look forward to hearing from other panelists. Thank Thanks, you. Tanya and Peter. That that was fantastic. That was that was great. And the decolonizemars.com. I I can't tell you how excited I am to hear to hear that you purchased that. That's, uh, that's genius. Um, and I have to say, like, I'm already really looking forward to uh, the conversation, the questions at the end of this panel. <laughs> um, so next, I'm going to turn it over to Bettina Forget. Uh, Bettina is an artist and educator based in Montreal, Canada, and she is the director of the SETI, which is the Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence Institute's Artist in Residence program located in Mountain View, California. In this capacity, she facilitates the collaboration between artists and SETI researchers. She foregrounds art science research practice and weaves a network of institutional partners active in art, science, and technology. Her creative practice and academic research examine the recontextualization of art and science and how transdisciplinary education may disrupt gender stereotypes. Bettina works with traditional as well as new media arts, focusing on astrobiology, sci-fi, and feminism. She's currently a doctoral candidate in art education at Concordia University, where her project Imagining, or sorry, Imagine Aliens is supported by a Shirk Joseph, um, Joseph Armand Bombardier Doctoral Fellowship and the Renata and Michelle Hornstein Doctoral Scholarship. Her work has been exhibited internationally, including um, ISCA in Barcelona, SciFest 13 in St. Petersburg, and the Planetarium uh, Rio Tinto Alcan in Montreal. So over to you, Bettina. Hello, everyone. And I'm so delighted to be included in this fantastic show and on this panel. And I already have so many questions for uh, Peter and um, Tanya. Uh, but I will get to my slides. I always like to have uh, slides because, you know, um, I'm a visual person. So we will just do that. OK. I'm going to talk about pink moons and rogue planets. We are going to start with familiar territory. Um, we all know the moon best. It's our closest celestial object. We have folklore about it. The moon appears in stories, in poems, in song, in painting. I love this rendition of the, um, of the moon because it shows us 
the place as a 3D. This is a view we don't often get of the moon. And it was a science that allowed us to sort of get a new perspective on what the moon is as a place. I actually uh, am a bit of an amateur astronomer. Uh, I have a couple of telescopes and I like to use them to look at the moon. I live fairly downtown Montreal and so the sky is fairly bright, but you can always see the moon. And I did, um, I, this is kind of like Galileo uh, also looking at the moon with his telescope. He did the same thing as what we just saw with this rotation of the moon as a three-dimensional object. He his his um, his view and his drawings of the moon showed them as a place and not as this idealized sphere made of ether that is just like more like an ideal place. He noticed that it's all rugged and full of mountains and that, that it looks imperfect. And I really love that. So I always also like to draw at the eyepiece. And um, because for, especially for a beginner, one moon crater looks very much like another moon crater. I use, uh, you know, this very well-known Atlas of the moon. And uh, I noticed that all the Maria, the, so the dark spots on the moon are named after um, uh, sort of uh, feelings, you know, like uh, sea of tranquility or um, they are, um, sort of weather related, like an ocean of storm, but all the craters are named after people. So of course I wondered who are these people? Uh, they tend to be mathematicians and philosophers. And then I wondered how many of those are women? So how many moon craters are named after women? This is just a question that popped up in my mind. And um, you can maybe put in the chat what you think how many moon craters are named after women? It's more than zero, as a hint. Uh, the percentage of male to female is not 50-50 because I'm, I realized it wouldn't be that because I'm not that, I'm an optimist, but I'm not utopian. Uh, so here it is, out of, of 1,578 catalog craters on the moon, there are many more craters, but those have been cataloged. 33 are named after women, that's 2%. Um, I was a little bit disappointed. I thought it would be low. I didn't realize it would be this low. So why does it matter even? I mean, it's on the moon. Why should we care what things on the moon are named after? Uh, I love this Lucy Lippert quote, naming is with mapping and photography, the way we image and imagine communal history and identity. So it does matter. It does matter how we name things around us because it's this recursive relationship with that we have with our, uh, our environment, especially in cities. So I, I picked up this lovely little map of London because that's where Macintosh Gallery is located. Um, I, I think it's even on Western University's archives that I pulled this one out. And I want you, it doesn't matter where you are, I know you're zooming in from all over the world, just do this little exercise, go in front in your mind, on, on, the, on your doorstep, on your front door, walk down the street and think about how many streets are named after women, how many parks, how many monuments of women, actual named women, how many rivers, how many plazas. And, you know, I think you may find that it hovers around two to 10%. So as above, so below, we project our aspirations and our thoughts and um, our attitudes onto space. So for me, it does matter. And I feel that the uh, this erasure and this absence of women on the nomenclature of the moon, and frankly also on, on earth, sort of contributes to uh, society and science. Um, they're creating an absence of women and erasing the uh, contribution that those women have made. Uh, so what to do if you're an artist? Well, I, I like to do what I call uh, protest by celebration. And I created the project Women with Impact where I first, my first step was to make drawings of all the moon craters. I already sketched at the eyepiece. So I figured the, uh, the, way, the way I 
sort of get to know a subject is with a pencil in my hand. So it's like, let's just draw everything. And uh, here, a couple of the drawings that are made of moon craters. What is lovely about moon craters is that they are very diverse. If you saw this um, initial map of the moon that you looked at, you would think that maybe craters are just holes on the ground. Um, but they are not. They have central peaks. They have terraced walls. They have secondary craters. Uh, the crater Mitchell is really old. It's gotten a lot of uh, sort of bombardment from other uh, meteorites, and you can barely make it out. Uh, a little crater like Blag is just a hole, so it just it just looks basically like a bowl crater. And what I created was basically a family portrait of the craters of the moon that are named after women. Uh, and I love this play on words, women with impact, because a moon crater is an absence of regolith, but it also speaks to the absence of women in the scientific canon and uh, that erasure of their contributions. Um, so this is an installation of 30 drawings at Forman Gallery. That was when it was first exhibited. And I have since added drawings because fortunately the International Astronomical Union who decides what things are named in the universe um, has made an effort to name more moon craters after women. I don't know who pushed them or if they saw my article uh, in the New York Times, but somebody woke up and just realized that the situation was not a good one. Uh, I love that when art sort of sits at the intersection of art and science, it can also live in the science context. So the work was also shown at the planetarium which was nice, you, you reach a completely different audience there. And once my series of drawings was finished, I went, oh, okay, it was fun, but if you want to make an impact, go big or go home. So I decided to um, turn the drawings into paintings. So this is an action shot of a corner of my studio, which you also see behind me. Um, so you see that these canvases are much larger. Uh, 48 by 48 usually or down to 40 by 40 and they are very pink so I decided to turn the craters pink because pink is such a political color it is so tied to femininity um, irresistible to girls radioactive to boys uh, pink is barbie pink is drag pink is baby pink pink pink, pink can, can be polite so I played around with all kinds of different pigments of pink, even adding actual fluorescent paint to the pigment as I was painting it, because I want these to be unapologetically pink, smack you over the head pink. So I uh, turned the grayscale of these craters into pink surfaces, so going with the topography uh, a little bit. And like the drawings, I like to emphasize um, certain features. Again, it's more like a portrait rather than a scientific illustration where I want it to look a little bit fleshy, a bit like skin, and uh, but still have everything in the right place. So when you come from the sciences and you look at this and you go, oh, of course, this is Resnick and McAuliffe uh, craters, but it should still work as a painting. Uh, and I love uh, this picture. Helen sent this to me uh, after she unboxed these. And um, so this is before they were hung. But I, I love the shot because of the uh, really reflective gallery um, floor. And it looks like high tide is coming in. Uh, and that the uh, gravity of these paintings have pulled in the ocean. Uh, so uh, it's just a wonderful shot. So thanks, Helen, for this one. And seeing all of these together and, and not in my studio was also lovely. So I love this piece, uh, Lewis quote, a human landscape is an unwitting autobiography reflecting our tastes, our values, our aspirations. This uh, kind of echoes the Lucy Lippert quote from earlier. And uh, now that we're going into space, what does human landscape mean really? Um, once we go into space and we look down at Earth, the way we look down at the, at the moon as a three-dimensional object, suddenly the Earth becomes a three-dimensional object. Is the International Space Station a human landscape? 
Will the moon become a human landscape? And what does it mean to venture into space? Um, how are our aspirations for um, exploring these landscapes? You know, what, what, what does it mean? And also, who are we sharing these landscapes with? Um, we may be not alone out there. So once we look beyond, the question uh, comes, you know, are we alone in the universe? Which is where I'm tying in the SETI Institute. That is kind of the fundamental question that the SETI Institute is asking. It's, I think, the most profound question you can ask as a science query, frankly. Um, it puts the Copernican you know, revolution to shame as a paradigm shift. The mission of the SETI Institute, this is, you know, what it, what it says on the website, but I love that we're looking at the origins and prevalence of life and intelligence of the universe. And the SETI Institute is also a research, a research, but also educational space where the idea is to be transparent and share this knowledge with the world. And he, these kind of questions, they touch on philosophy. You know, what is the nature of life? If you want to ask the question, is there life out there? What do we mean by life? Um, we don't have a good definition of it. And right now, as we're looking for alien signals with those radio dishes that you saw in the previous slide, we're really taking the um, idea of technology as a stand-in for intelligence, because you need to be reasonably intelligent to build maybe a telescope, a radio telescope, or send us signals. But there are different kinds of intelligence as all uh, as well. So our scientists actually ponder these questions. They are not very linear thinkers. So if you want to work in this field, it really requires of you to ponder these questions in depth, which is why we have an artist in residence program. Jill Tata, who's one of the founders of the SETI Institute, I asked her, you know, like, why did you even green light the uh, artist in residence uh, program, having artists running around the Institute? And she says, well, we're trying to conceive of the inconceivable and we need um, imagination for that. And that's what artists do. So she really loves the artist in residence program. Um, of course, we don't do more than just listen. Uh, we have also one of our big um, research areas is uh, exoplanet research. We have now found over 5,000 confirmed ones. That number is growing the whole time. Just think of this as you're looking at the night sky and you're seeing all these stars. Each star is orbited by at least one planet. So when you're looking up, you're not actually looking at stars. You're looking at other worlds. And I love how crazy these worlds are. Uh, they are, they are, you know, lava worlds. They are worlds that are, have so much gravitational pressure that the ice is burning. It's a new form of ice, ice X. There are worlds that are raining glass horizontally and are several thousand degrees hot. Eyeball planets uh, are tidally locked and one side always points to what the star and maybe the an icy shell melts a little bit and looks like a giant eyeball staring at the a, at a sun. You know, it, it's just crazy what's out there. It's crazier than science fiction. And I love rogue planets. So this even puts into question what a planet is. So rogue planets are planets that do not orbit any stars, but were kicked out into the cosmos during the formation of their solar system. So they're just floating around there completely in darkness, no gravitational association whatsoever fascinating objects and make us really rethink what a planet even is. Um, so I teamed up with an other artist in residence, Scott Kildall, and our planetary, uh, chief planetary scientist, Frank Marchi. Uh, the SETI Institute is a nonprofit. Uh, last year or like the year before, you know, when remember when NFTs were a thing in crypto, we thought, hey, you know what, we'll raise some money for the SETI Institute, we'll do some. NFTs and the uh, trustee who was advising us said, you know, you could just, you know, like sell, you know how you can sell stars, you should just sell exoplanets and Scott and I were going like, mm, no, we're not. Um, this is this is not the way we're thinking you can't just sell other worlds, we came up with a different idea. It's called Exotopia. It's an online storytelling experience. You buy yourself a ticket and you every day you get a, a little bit of a story. 
the idea behind it is that we did not want to have uh, this approach to uh, exploring outer space with this kind of settler mentality, this colonialist mentality. So no manifest destiny in space. And I love that uh, Tanya and Peter also sort of mentioned that um, uh, sort of that, that thinking as well about who owns the space when you go somewhere. Um, that idea that the new world will be a tabula rasa and that we are as humans, you know, destined to explore and own these worlds. So Scott and I decided, first of all, none of that. Secondly, no, uh, no wars, no fighting. We are not going to go and kill any aliens. We want no stories about that. Instead, we aligned with the mission of the SETI Institute, which is exploration, curiosity, and humility. Uh, you go at, to a planet and you let it teach you. So we are building science fiction stories uh, around that. I wrote the prototype, so the, the, the first kind of idea of that. Oh, um, I also love that Tanya and Peter mentioned the Outer Space Treaty, which I wrote out here. I, I love that it says that, you know, there's no discrimination of any kind and we all have equal access to space, but I'm reading uh, Erica Neswald's uh, Of Earth right now. And she has this great quote that there's a difference between being allowed to travel in space and being able to. Um, so not everybody does have access to space. Uh, the only people who so far can go up are if you have a degree in the STEM field or if you're a millionaire. Uh, that is, you know, not that means not everybody is able to go. Um, I thought about who should be able to go. So I have um, designed. Um, I, I realize that my time is running short. I'm just going to do try to do this like in five minutes to be quick. Um, so I designed a crew that goes to a rogue planet, these kind of planets that do not orbit any stars, and I made them as interesting as possible. So this is in the future. This is a future space mission. We are no longer just sending millionaires and, and STEM scientists into space. We do, however, have Kai Chino, who is a Kenyan-born astrobiologist. Uh, Tane An has a background that is both Korean and German. So they have, uh, they are non-binary, they are both Asian and European, and they are both in the arts and the sciences. So there's this interesting perspective from having two worlds. Heiko is uh, born on Mars, the first Mars baby, and therefore has a dis different physique and does better in lower gravity. So I'm speaking there also to different uh, abilities, disabilities, and different contexts of the human body and space. And Trigg uh, comes from Tierra del Fuego. He's a chief engineer. And he's been at this rogue, uh, he's been sent ahead to the planet to set up the station. He's been very lonely for a very long time. I'm just drawing on my COVID experience there. And, but unlike me, uh, he did um, develop some substance abuse problems and he has issues with mental health. So uh, I wanted to have a really sort of interesting and diverse crew. I created fake Wikipedia pages for everybody that you can link to uh, check out on my website, just to give everybody a backstory because on, I only had eight days to write uh, eight day chunks to show have people read the story. Um, that meant I couldn't use a lot of exposition and I had a lot of fun inventing references and life stories for all of my characters and play with the, um, so it's the format of uh, Wikipedia. For example, Trigg is a little bit underappreciated. Uh, he only has a wiki stub and his claim to fame is um, mustache championship, three star mustache winner. So, it, you know, reading these before you go on that journey will give you a bit of backstory. Uh, I use Twine to write all the stories. So when you log into the Exotopia site, you don't know what you're getting. This is basically like ex real life exploration every day is a surprise and several people will never experience the same story. So that was also that was important to us. And so, for example, if so, in, when you go to the website, this may be, you know, one day's uh, story that you're getting. Um, you know, Kai is uh, very intuitive and, uh, you know, she's really looking forward to this. Whereas on the same day, Heiko is getting a cramp because the parts are not designed 
for Martians and he knows that space can kill you and he's very sort of stickle and linear thinker so right away you're setting the tone there um the creative prompt for me was to find silicon based life which is uh inspired by endolith this is an extremophile that lives on uh, in Antarctica, which some of our astrobiologists are looking at at the SETI Institute. These are life forms that live inside rocks and eat them from the inside out. Um, they have been around long before any other kind of life. And I'm wondering if maybe we are the extremophiles because they've been here for millions of years and they still persist. I created some uh, illustrations. So this was last year when AI and Mitrani sort of came in and um since scott was using twine to write an algorithm to deliver the story every day to the website i thought let's use an algorithm to make the art and uh, uh created um uh, posters with this that sort of would drop into the um the story as it was unfolding every day and there's an animation I used the um, Mitrani images as uh, starting images to um, so create this really trippy um, animation. So since uh, Trig has a bit of a substance abuse problem, it was kind of cool to have something that was somewhat hallucinatory uh, going on using a stable diffusion's deform. Uh, and uh, I was really just playing with the AI there and see what's it, what it gave me there. And uh, I, I love the gritty grittiness. Um, but there was always uh, this tug of war between the pictures that I had in my mind and what an AI can deliver. So it's definitely not uh, a substitute for my own work. Uh, as you see, I'm still fairly analog painting and drawing. But uh, this is an exploration that I will continue. And uh, yeah, if you want to get in touch with me, feel free. I, I think that is my time. Sorry, I'm st still on you. Um, thank you, Bettina. Amazing. Um, yeah, we had somebody come in to the, the gallery uh, yesterday or the day before and was um, was really taken aback by the fact that I'd made the choice to um, exhibit some AI work. And she's like, why? And because it's a tool um, in yeah. this particular case, um, you know, used by an artist who actually has a very uh a very sort of broad practice including a lot of as you said analog um uh practices so um anyway uh, i'm going to move along to jesse jesse tungalik uh jesse tungalik is an interdisciplinary uh, artist based in the Kaluit nunavut he has worked in many artistic disciplines starting at only eight years old as a ceramic sculptor at the Matchbox Gallery in uh, Kange Clinic, which is Rankin, Rankin Inlet in Nunavut, um, before working at Matthew uh, Nukingak's Ayura studio in Akalawit as a jewelry artist uh, specializing in baleen, muskox, horn, ivory, and silver. Tungalik also works in mixed media sculpture with pieces exhibited at the Winnipeg Art Gallery, Nuit Blanche, Montreal, the Nunavut Arts Festival, the Great Northern Arts Festival, the Banff Center for the Arts, and the Oceanographic Museum in Monaco, among others. His work can be found in both public and private collections nationally and internationally, including, including the Cernak Indigenous Art Collection in Ottawa, uh, and the Museum Czerny Inuit Collection in Bern, Switzerland. Tungalik has served as both a manager of cultural industries for the government of Nunavut and as the executive director of the Nunavut Art and Craft Association, as well as the chairperson for the Board of Trustees for, and um, Jesse, can you just quickly dip in here and, uh, and say this correctly for me? The Nunata... Sure, it's the Nunata Sunakatangi Museum. Thank you, Inakalawit. Uh, and he's a member of the Inuit Governance Group uh, of the Inuit Futures in Arts Leadership uh, Shirk Partnership Grant, which is a which is running from 2018 to 2025. He's currently a social and cultural policy analyst uh, at Nunavut Tungavik Incorporated. So over to you, Jesse. I'm very much looking forward to hearing you talk about your work. Um, and um, I will just say in advance that the, the sealskin spacesuit, which we borrowed from Cernak, 
uh, is is truly, truly spectacular. Um, and yeah, it is definitely a, a fan favorite as uh, as I was told that it was going to be. So over to you. Thanks, Helen. Uh, yeah, I, uh, to start off with, I just want to um, <laughs> say I'm 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 uh, kind of I'm still recovering from COVID, so I'm um, <clears throat> not feeling the best. Uh, so I'll, I'll I'll try to keep my my portion uh, short. Um, I'm, yeah, I'm not feeling that great. Uh, so as Helen said, um, uh, my uh, the the piece the uh, sealskin spacesuit is uh, is um, exhibited uh, as part of this show. Um, I just want to to give some background as to how that uh, project came about and some of my my thinking um, uh, around that. Uh, so just to give a quick background, uh, so that uh, this project came about uh, when when I was invited to participate in a uh, artist uh, residency in Montreal at uh, Concordia, um, and the um, the theme around that that residency was Indigenous futures. Uh, so I was asked to come up with some ideas uh, around that <clears throat> around that theme and. Uh, uh, and basically, yeah, the uh, the concept that I came up with was the, the to to make a um, a bespoke um, spacesuit uh, made out of uh, traditional Inuit materials. Uh, in, in this case, uh, seal skin. Uh, basically, like the the idea came about initially uh, through like uh, childhood um, memory of. Just like imagining, um, I, I grew up in, in Nunavut. Um, it's, it's a very um, cold, uh, very uh, extreme, um, extreme environment. So, uh, so every time I would uh, go outside uh, to to play or whatever uh, during the winter time when I was a child, I had to go through this big process of putting on all these clothes. Uh, uh, my mother made me uh, uh, very warm caribou skin clothing, um, which which um, keeps you warm basically, um, no matter how how cold it gets. But it was it was a big process of uh, putting putting it on. It would take like five ten minutes just to to get all the clothing on, and uh, through. Like doing that, I, I kind of imagine myself uh, putting on a spacesuit to to go out in, into this uh, space-like environment <clears throat> in the uh, this uh, yeah very cold environment. Um, so that's that's basically how that idea came about. But uh, like through throughout the process of um, uh, researching and uh, kind of. Uh, Figuring out the coordination of, of how it would be done, um, I, I, I worked with uh, a number of uh, other Inuit from from um, uh, a bunch of uh, different uh, regions around Canada, and it kind of, uh, in my mind it kind of um, mirrored the the, um, the the process of, of designing and uh, constructing the the original Apollo. Uh, Space, space suits um, and just as, as a quick aside there um, it, it was actually a uh, playtex the um, wonder wonder bra people that that came up with uh, the um, the original uh, apollo uh, spacesuit design uh, which is uh, kind of a neat uh, little tidbit um, but uh, yeah like through throughout the process of uh, Designing the the spacesuit and figuring figuring out the, the materials, uh, like as I said, this this residency was was done in in Montreal in a urban environment. Uh, I, I grew up in in Nunavut, which is very remote, and um, our communities are very small. And um, and uh, so to me, like going to to um, 
to Montreal. It, it was it was it was like going to um, to a foreign like a to a uh, alien world basically, um, and uh, I, I kind of imagined like uh, what what that um, um, what what that kind of uh, meant to me um, and and also like um, uh, like for example like the um, NASA they they uh, for a number of years now that they, they've been coming up to to Nunavut to um, to uh, Devon Island to uh, you use the our landscape as as a kind of um, way to train uh, for for how um, astronauts would um, would live on um, like uh, would live on Mars um, and yeah I mean like uh, uh, the Arctic uh, where, where I live uh, was was one of the last uh, like frontiers for for uh, European um, colonization and exploration and uh, I thought it was um, I saw the parallels between um, how how the uh, European colonial um, uh, powers kind of like it's, it's the same kind of mentality um, uh, when, when we talk about the colonization of space um, there, there's a lot of talk about uh, how like the the colonization of space is supposed to be like a, a multicultural international cooperation thing, but I mean, like the the reality of that is like uh, the space race was was uh, adversarial, um, uh, an adversarial uh, thing between the, the the United States and the Soviet Union. Uh, now nowadays uh, the the shift has been more towards like the privatization of the, the exploration of space with uh, with um, Elon Musk and uh, and uh, as, as was mentioned, uh, um, uh, Bezos um, and now I mean like as, as we're considering like the 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 idea of uh, colonizing Mars. Uh, it's it's now been uh, it's shifted to like a very capitalist, very uh, privatized, um, profit uh, profit driven um, thing. Like uh, uh, Elon Musk uh, basically has has said that uh, his his idea for the colonization of Mars is uh, to to basically have indentured slaves. Um, uh, like colonize it. So I mean, like it, it's it that that to me is very troubling, and um, I, I like throughout the process of of um, researching the uh, the space suit and thinking about the idea of uh, of uh, colonizing. I, I wanted to imagine like an alternative, um, like a an alternative reality where where Inuit uh, were colonized and we were able to develop uh, at our own pace and develop our own uh, space exploration program. Uh, and um, I wanted to uh, imagine what that might be like using like Inuit um, Inuit cultural values uh, that that uh, put a, a, a much higher emphasis on uh, cooperation with uh, with um, helping each other. Uh, I also wanted to kind of reflect on like the idea that that Inuit uh, indigenous peoples and especially Inuit are like primitive uh, peoples uh, that that um, uh, yeah that are kind of like stuck in the the stone age but the reality is i mean like uh, inuit are, are very inventive people who came up with uh, like very um very advanced like technology to live in the this very extreme 
environment that, that we live in like and uh, a lot of those uh, like in cultural inventions are, are used today in, in the modern world such as like the kayak the uh, the igloo um our our, our clothing the, the use of um uh, dog teams and, and and such so i kind of want to 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 um, re reflect on on that um uh yeah uh, <laughs> i'm um I'm sorry, I'm, I'm still feeling um, pretty, pretty <laughs> sick. So I think I'll, I'll probably leave it at that. that I really time. appreciate I really appreciate that, Jesse. Uh, I had COVID just a few months ago myself and can really emp um, emp empathize, especially with the runny nose part, which like goes on for a really long time. <laughs> Well, thank you. Uh, Jesse, I very, very much appreciate you doing this while you're feeling so lousy. Um, if you feel the need to like cut out early, that's okay. Everybody would completely understand. So um, next, uh, I'm going to invite Camille. We still have Camille on here, don't, don't we? We haven't lost Camille, have we? I don't see her name coming up. Um, I'm going to introduce Camille, and hopefully we still have her. Uh, Camille is an artist scholar whose work uh, combines Afrofuturism and historical research. Her most recent explorations confront the entanglement of what is now Canada in the transatlantic trade in Africans. She puts into practice Afronautics, a methodological frame she developed to approach colonial archives from the point of view of a liberated future. Camille is a graduate of OCAD and has recently completed a PhD at York University's Faculty of Environmental and Urban Change. Currently, she is a provost's postdoctoral fellow at University of Toronto's Daniels Faculty of Architecture, Landscape and Design. Turner is the recipient of the 2002 Artist Prize from the Toronto Biennial, or Biennial of Art. Her artworks are held in museums and public and private collections, including the National Gallery of Canada, the Art Museum of the University of Toronto, the Art Gallery of Hamilton, the Art Gallery of Nova Scotia, the Canada Council Art Bank, the Royal Bank of Canada, Museum London, the Wedge Collection, and the Rooms. <laughs> So sorry. <laughs> That's okay. Honestly, you were just back in time. <laughs> I just introduced great. you in case you came back. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Jeez. Oh, you've already introduced me. Oh, yeah, oh. just then. But like just then, just okay. then. The timing is actually immaculate. All right. All right. <laughs> All right. So I'll just launch in then. <laughs> Thank you so, so much for this invitation, Helen. And this has been a rich conversation. I've just been loving hearing all of the, the panelists. Thank you. So um, since, since I was a kid, I have been obsessed with space. And um, I was always a big sci-fi nerd. I, I read a lot of sci-fi. I watched the Jetsons on TV with their automatic everything in their flying cars. And I'm old enough to remember the original Star Trek long before all the rerun, the um, perpetual um, um, series um, came out. Um, but in these depictions of space, there were few black, uh, brown, indigenous people or people of color. Uh, Mr. Sulu and Lieutenant Uhura were um, notable exceptions. And aside from a few background characters, um, space was depicted as a place that belonged to white folks. And, um, and, and of course in Star Trek, Captain Kirk, a white man was unquestionably the, the natural leader of a colonizing mission to boldly go where no man has gone before. So as an artist, I reimagine space as a place um, inhabited by people who look like me. And um, at, but at first I used space to assert my belonging to earth. 
So my first space project was The Final Frontier, and it was created in 2007 as a collaboration between um, my friend Sobaz Benjamin, who's a filmmaker who now lives in Halifax, uh, my sister Karen Turner, and my brother Lee Turner, um, both based in Toronto, and myself. And this piece emerged from my alienating experience of visiting Lethbridge, Alberta, um, a few years before. I, I remember traveling to Lethbridge and seeing this, what, um, you know, Jesse, you were just talking about the, this, this idea of an alien landscape. For me, that was an alien landscape. I'd never seen anything like this. But then when I got into town, I realized from the way people responded to me that I was the alien. So this was the the sort of um, initial um, incident that that triggered this response. So um, basically, the Afronauts, as Afronauts, we travel together, interacting with local people and recording the intercultural exchanges that happened. Um, we don't speak, so they don't know who we are, where we're from, but they make a lot of assumptions. Um, and some of them are very um, funny. <laughs> but what we're trying to do is to unmask what's going on underneath the polite multicultural narratives of um, Canadian um, society. So, um, so yeah, this, this, this is a piece that um, sort of started my space explorations. Um, and in this piece, space, is depicted as a place that African descended people had explored for millennia. It's a place that we, where we've developed knowledge and a place from which we return to our beloved earth with a mission to save the planet. We bring back knowledge and we, we bring this knowledge home to share with um, those we encounter, fellow earthlings. Well, the idea for the Afronauts and their knowledge of the stars was actually inspired by um, the Dogon people of Northern Mali. They have a knowledge of stars that's embedded in their stories for millennia. Um, and their stories and their spiritual practices. Their most sacred star is Sirius B and it's a white dwarf with a 60 year elliptical orbit around Sirius. And you can't see Sirius B with your naked eye. And yet this star has been a part of Dogon stories. Um, so since the final frontier, I've created many projects about space, such as Afronautic Research Lab. And this is a futuristic archive that's a part of um, our continuing mission to save the planet. Afronauts unsilenced suppressed historical documents to enable visitors to reconnect the past to the present. Now, these are real archival documents. I actually go into archives, I digitize information, documents, and I laminate them. And I bring people into the space with uh, magnifying glasses and um, um, flashlights so that so, so people understand what it's like digging around the dark to find these this um this information um so so the the whole idea is once you connect reconnect the past to the present then the future must change but in 2019 i created awakening and this this is the piece that's in the show and at, in this piece earth is, is space is depicted very differently earth is no longer home like Dion Brand, we've given up on land. The unthinkable has already happened. Earth has become unlivable for Black life. We don't return to save the planet. We've cut the cord. Space has become a refuge and a retreat. It's a place where we can breathe. Um, and this, this project started in 2014 when I went to Senegal to, to learn about the roots of Afrofuturism. I came there with the question, how are Africans imagining the future? And I wanted to, 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 to look at the roots of what the book is doing um, that I haven't really experienced firsthand. Um, everywhere I went, there were reminders of the past. Um, the past was all around me. Um, I, for instance, I went on an architectural walking tour 
to the beautiful UNESCO World Heritage Site of San Luis, which is about five hours north of Dakar, you know, the capital city. Um, and I found myself in the room of um, people who were described as a young French couple who had been the first traders in the area in the 18th century. I was in their basement when the guide said that this is the this was um, a, a holding cell where captured people were imprisoned. So I fell back in time and I imagined my ancestors in that dark, dank cell. And in my time travels, I searched for the source of this trade in African people. So I found this matter. And on one of my journeys. I found myself on a spaceship and there were two astronauts who greeted me. I couldn't speak, but they seemed to be able to read my thoughts and I needed their help. I needed their help to accomplish this mission. So I wanted them to travel back with me to the past and help me stop this human trafficking that went on for centuries. They grasped the conundrum. If we succeed, we would undo this massive crime in which millions of people were robbed of their lives, but this world would also be unraveled and we would cease to exist. So, so that is the way that I use space in this piece, Awakening. Um, I, I travel both through time and space to present this modern day dilemma. The African diaspora in this piece is perpetually in motion. We're adrift um, in this placeless place. Um, and this crime against people of African descent undergirds the modern world. And this is revealed in this, in this piece. This um, and this 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 um the weight of this history still hasn't been reckoned with. So space here becomes a place where we find liberty and we can forge new futures, but also a place where we can uncover um, the past and, and think about the future. Right, so that's, that's all I wanted to say. Thank you, Camille, that was perfect. Um, I would like to open the floor to questions, but that also includes questions that any of the panelists might have for one another. Uh, I see that, so we seem to have lost both Tanya, although we knew we were going to lose Tanya because she is actually teaching <laughs> at this moment, uh, but we have also lost Peter because his internet has dropped. Um, Let's see, I'm looking in the Q&A. Oh, the only question is, um, when is the exit exhibition open until, and the answer to that is December 9th. Um, no, somebody's asking what your next project is, uh, Camille. Oh, the, the, oh boy. Working on all kinds of things. <laughs> <laughs> But um, I continue to use what I call aphronautics, a way of um, looking at the past through the future to shed light on the present. And I've been working with this, this knowledge that um, is very fairly new to me um, of, of these slave ships that were built in 18th century Newfoundland. Um, there were ships built all along the eastern seaboard of what is now called Canada, but um, these ships are, they're in the archive, but they haven't, um, you know, I haven't really seen anyone sort of, or very many people writing about them. There's mentions, but so I've been, I've been um, um, looking at these ships and thinking about the people that were carried in their holds. And I'm I'm using you know aphronautics to excavate this story and to to bring this knowledge into into um, consciousness. Yeah, found that whole. I mean, I've been finding that whole body of work, um, you know, to be you know fascinating, but also personally kind of affecting. I mean, because I grew up in in Newfoundland, and it is just not how. 
<laughs> they portrayed themselves out there. You know, this whole kind of part of history that, you know, is so, so deeply horrible. Um, yeah, it really, it's really in contrast to the way, I mean, Canadians in general, and certainly, you know, anybody with that sort of seafaring history or, you know, living in Newfoundland likes to think of, you know, their own history. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but that seafaring history is so entangled in the, the production of this modern world. And yeah. That, yeah. that's what um, that's what seems to be emerging, like a different view of what the past has been is emerging. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the research. And uh, there's a lot of researchers that have been already doing this work. I'm just, a, a, you know, as an artist, I, I, I feel, you know, that my job now is to to look at um, the people who haven't been looked at in this whole journey, which is the people that were carried on these ships. Um, you know, my ancestors were carried on ships like these and perhaps these very ships. Yeah. Let's see. Oh wait, I may have another question here. Oh no, it's the same question. Hang on, I need to mark that as answered. There we go. Okay, now we have another question, which I think is also for you, Camille. Uh, the question is, what mediums do you usually use? And how do you feel your choice of medium best helps you share your message? Oh, boy. Well, for me, I'm, I, I guess I'm kind of transdisciplinary. I use a lot of different media. It really depends on what it is I'm trying to, to do. Um, but mainly installation, video um social practice there's a lot of interactive work like the the Afronautic research lab for instance it's kind of a performance social practice piece I invite people to come into the archive and see these these artworks I create this futuristic archive that people can enter into yeah so it takes a lot of different forms yeah I'm gonna scroll back through the comments and see if there's any additional actual questions do any of you have questions for one another? I do I do wish we hadn't lost Peter. I feel like there's so much resonance um, amongst everybody's work. I mean, it's always the thing that, you know, when we do these panel discussions, you know, obviously everybody's been selected for a reason, but, you know, seeing these kind of, you know, resonances amongst everybody's work, I always find to be particularly gratifying. I would love to know if, um, Jesse, are you working on pieces that um, connect with the space suit? Are you, or, um, yeah, I'm just curious as to whether you're you're further exploring this. Uh, yeah, I, I, I did explore that, that idea. Uh, Originally, when I, I came up with the concept, uh, I was imagining like a series of of, um, of uh, spacesuits, uh, uh, kind of mirroring the the, the different regional um, uh, styles of uh, of uh, inuit clothing, uh, and also um, like uh, incorporating like um, like children, uh, women. Uh, because they they all each each have the, um, <clears throat> distinctive um, uh, designs uh, to them. Um, I, I'm I'm still keeping that open ended, but um, at, at this point, I don't have any definite plans to do that. Oh, you know Good question, but it's from Joel. Uh, Joel, do you want to just ask your question? <laughs> yeah, I was. Yeah, so so sorry, but it's actually for Bettina. <clears throat> Hi. Um, it was it was so really so nice to uh, to to hear you uh, talk about your work and the freedom with which uh, you're expressing yourself uh, and and the artworks and the stories and the narratives um, within within the SETI as well. And, you know, um, it, as we know, uh, collaborations with scientists and engineers within their context is sometimes 
uh, very challenging for an, for an artist to be in and and there is a limit to how sometimes there is a limit to how provocative these ideas can be and and you know one might say this is somewhat similar in, in society as well and you can be as provocative as you want but then at, at a certain point you start to speak only to the converted so I, I wonder what the reception of your work has been uh in the in the engineering side of things at, at SETI or or the, where the where the scientists are um and if you had some yeah experiences to share yeah that's a great question uh our artists and residence program has been around for 12 years now wasn't started by me was started by Charles Lindsay who is also an artist and kind of prototyped the idea of having artists gallivanting around the SETI Institute and there was a little bit of groundwork to do because when you speak to scientists and oh I think general public and you tell them I make art they typically default to this idea of well doing doing right this kind of art painting uh, and especially astronomical art so you're making nice illustrations of the uh, surface of uh, Mars and so very often the idea was of the scientist going here's my data make it look pretty and the artists were going well that's not the kind of art that I do so what is contemporary artistic practice um, this is a conversation that the scientists kind of had to get on board with and learn about. And I sat in, uh, when I first started with the SETI uh, Institute, I actually shadowed a couple of artists and with their conversations. And I noticed that there was like sometimes a little bit of a disconnect, but sometimes when, it, when the scientists were talking about bigger questions like uh, Lawrence Doyle, looks at communication and the sort of ratio of noise to signal and what whales know like whale language and their relationship to human language because right now we've, we've all been talking about you know our own human presence and going out into space you know whales are earthlings lichen is an earthling a tree is an earthling so lawrence you know sort of has that framework sort of conceptual framework and that's when the artists really connect well and um so it kind of depends on which scientist you talk to because we've been around a uh, program has been around for a while and they started to see the outcomes and be like oh you guys do installation oh this uh, this artist made an, like an album you know on the idea of the first 10,000 days after first contact it's like I'm so on board with it uh, and so there is more of a meeting of minds now um I do happy hours so we do these zoom calls where artists and, and scientists connect and I'm just try to create like en enough shared spaces where our thoughts and ideas can mingle the idea is that artists and scientists are on eye level and that the scientists are not muses handing over data and say make it look pretty but there is a fair exchange of intellectual and inspirational value and that is sort of coming out and the mandate and also what I'm giving the the other artists in the program is like you do your thing and um the art the, it, you know Scott once made an, an art piece and the advising art scientist said like I don't you know I think this is not interesting and I don't see the point and Scott says well I see the point and I'm making it and I think it was a cool piece so this is what happens right so first of all create a freedom and slowly the scientists get get on board. I think that's really important when you have this kind of art science uh, collaborations. But thanks for that. That was an important question. And I hope that other institutions are also laying groundwork from those kind of collaborations, um, sort of keep that, that, that sort of indication that we need to first learn to speak the same language and kind of get on board with each other through conversation and then the art can unfold mm -hmm. how was your experience because you did something very similar and I, I loved your narrative where you started so going like oh my god you know these engineers so smart such little margin of error so different than the arts our mandate is to goof around mess up a lot and uh, <laughs> there are no consequences if I do an awful painting I can just go burn it um you know consequences are a little bit different when you're sending a probe into space mm -hmm. so what was your experience like well I think 
my experience uh, with a very tra traditional, a very um, uh, very traditional engineering facility was was that there was a lot of emphasis on on what the objectives were and how to reach them. Uh, so in speaking to the engineers, even through artistic problems, there wasn't a, a kind of emotional quotient that was that was tapped into. It was really about like how can we re engine how can we reverse engineer where this problem and, and how can we get to it, you know? Uh and and Helen will testify to that, even the heights of the the, you know, even thinking about where these circuit boards were going to be on the wall and how we can anticipate who would be interacting with it. This was also a like a quantitative survey that they had to they had to conduct. Um, almost um, systematically, right? Uh, so it was, it was, it was re I think it was really challenging, but I think the, the thing that was more challenging was not so much the process itself, but also just thinking about how how um, how to introduce provocative ideas uh, into their their frame of mind. And, and I, I had to start off, you know, I, I started off with these grandiose ideas of, okay, so we're gonna, we're gonna start thinking really, uh, you know, about decolonizing of space, you know, to, to, to jump into it, to, to think about that. But I realized when I got into the lab, um, we, 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 we could not function on, on that, at that level. And, and, you know, there was a, a fear there that, that I would just be shut off, like they wouldn't listen to me at all. And then we had to really start with the sensorial, like the body, you know, focus back on, on the embodied experience of, of space and that communal presence. Um, so, uh, I mean, I, I, I love that, uh, that quote also, Lucy Lippert, uh, quote that, that you put up, you know, I, I, I noted that also because that was, um, the, the idea of creating a communal history and, and identity just by naming something was is so profound. Uh, and it's such an easy thing that we can get to because they are starting to put their names on the circuit boards that they create. Uh, and they're also thinking about what how satellites are named and stuff. And that's such a such an accessible approach uh, to talking about these issues. Thank you. Mm -hmm. We have another question here from an anonymous attendee. Uh, this is a question for anyone, uh, but where do you think we are headed uh, in terms of the colonization of space and space travel? I wonder who will be chosen to be left behind on Earth and how we might commodify space, be exclusionist, despite the idea that space exploration is theoretically for all of mankind. Would anybody like to speculate? Well, maybe I can dovetail to what I said earlier that, you know, apparently space is for everyone, but we don't all have access. Um, and right now the selection process is based on utilitarian necessity. Somebody gets sent up because they can work a machine or the Canadarm or on the space station, or, you know, they can fly the thing. Uh, or if you're very, very rich, and that's kind of also utilitarian in a different way. Uh, if you're a millionaire and you can bring your buddies along. Uh, it is very difficult to make this equitable. I think maybe a lottery system would be a good approach. Uh, I think um, it would be interesting to look at humanity as a group. We tend to think ourselves as individual, like the hero astronaut, or am I going into space? But humans are a collective, and only as a collective can we thrive with this idea of going into space. So we need to think of like, how are we going to put a band together? You know, we need a drummer, we need a front man, we need a chorus, we need the tuba, we need everybody. So how are we going to put that into space? So don't think of the individual, think of think of the group and who every, everybody who needs to be invited to the party to plan it, to <laughs> connect on a joke. Uh, and I, I think that would be a good way forward. So, if, you know, take away the focus of, from the individual and, and broaden it to the group. That's a beautiful band, I want to say, Bettina. <laughs> a, a drummer, a frontman, and a tuba player. <laughs> I'd be way in the back with my electric guitar playing smoke on the water in the East Room. Yeah. 
Do we have any, um, I'm just going to make a, you know, I think I'm going to make a last call for questions from the audience or from the group here for one another. Um, and then afterwards, Liza is going to say a few things to, um, to her class. Everybody else will be sort of allowed to, you know, all the panelists can go, including myself, but uh, Liza will just uh, sort of stick around for a quick chat with her class. Ooh, we've got another, we have another question. This is for Camille. Uh, given that your work engages uh, the emancipatory power of space as a sphere of possibility for black liberation from white supremacy, how do you as an artist manage the weight of this creative project as an afterlife of slavery? Thank you for the question. I just finished my dissertation and that's exactly what it was about or what it became. Even though I'm looking at I'm looking at, you know, what the, the subject that I'm 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 looking at, but I can't do that without finding a way to um to survive the 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 journey. And and so that's how that's why I created Aphronautics. It's it's conjuring a liberated future and anchoring myself to that future. Um, that is the only way I can survive. And that so the future becomes a very important part of being able to survive, you know, a descent into the archive to do this work. Um, so yeah, so thank you for that. That's um, that's an important part of that's an important part of the work. Yeah, I really love that question about ancient civilizations from RH. Very interesting. Um, they wanted all of us to look at that. Oh, is that um, is that in the chat or in the question? Yeah, it's in the chat and it's above the other question. Okay, hold on, let me just uh, pull up the chats. I've got a few windows open here. Yeah, and the relationship between ancient societies and ob observations of the stars. Ah, uh, yes, here it is. Uh, yes, a question um, for both Jesse and so a question for each manner of the panel. Um, both Jesse and Camille touched on the relationship between ancient societies and observation of the stars. This relationship produced unique particular narratives relative to the society. Camille and Jesse mentioned that uh, the association with the art uh, they create, uh, but could we hear if this plays a part in anyone else's creative construct? Oh, and Manor should be member. Sorry. <laughs> yes, this is me reading from directly from the chat. Um, yeah, is there anyone else who feels like there is this uh, in their creative construct? I actually kind of wish that Peter and Tanya were mm -hmm. here because I I do feel that that question would um, would resonate with them in particular. Yeah, but alas, yeah, there's a lot of um, there's a lot of star knowledge that they talk about in ancient yeah. societies. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know. I really loved when they talked about um, how do we send sounds to the star people and the idea of using that drum as a way of like, you know, sending messages and communicating with, um, you know, I guess through space and time. I wish they were still here because I really enjoy their talk so much. Um, yeah. And listening, listening to the ancient knowledge that, you know, the, um, I wouldn't have been able to create the the Afronauts if I hadn't known about um, the Dogon people of of Northern Mali. Yeah, um, and just thinking about you know what counts as knowledge, and and um, and then also you know you you find things that you're looking for if you're not looking for um, you know how did they know that Sirius B existed. Yeah. yeah, this was my question. I mean, if they don't have that ability to sort of 
you know, to, like if they're not visualizing it, where is that knowledge coming from? It's, I mean, it's, it's incredible. Yeah. There's, yeah. There's a lot yeah, of it's, knowledge it's, that ancient civilizations hold. Yeah. Yeah. I, I find it beautiful that ancient civilizations still had that co direct connection to the night sky that we have lost because of light pollution and urbanization. And we don't look up anymore. Well, mostly because there's nothing to see now. But if you ask kids, you know, what moon phase it is, or you ask any adult to name a star sign other than the Big Dipper or Orion, they'll be hard pressed. And, you know, no wonder. And it's a pity because our galaxy is our home, our solar system is our home. You know, ancient people knew where Mars was and Venus, and we kind of lost that connection and the stand in is technology. So now we're looking at James Webb pictures and we're looking at Star Trek as a mediator for our relationship with, with the sky. And what I, you know, the, one of the reasons why I'm an amateur astronomer is because I take my telescope out and I get a live view of Jupiter. That is a smudge, frankly. Um, and the picture from Hubble would be much nicer, but the thrill I'm getting from seeing it live, having that direct you know, view, that connection, it gives me a buzz like I've had a Red Bull. It's, it's mm -hmm. that strong. And, and so become an evangelist. And you know, sometimes I go out with my telescope. I have this Dobsonian, which was designed for sidewalk astronomy, and I let other people look through it. And sometimes they will look in front of the tube, like I glued something to it. So they, oh, I can see Saturn rings like through this thing. So yeah, you can. Like the excitement, you know? And ancient people had that because they got to see the Milky Way. We don't see it anymore. Um, so I think there's much to be said for amateur astronomy and just getting out of the city and sort of reestablishing that connection with with the cosmos. If, if I could add like just one one small thing, Bettina, just to 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 build on what you were saying about, you know, the, uh, I think sometimes we we think about ancient societies in a very distant uh, and removed fashion. Um, that it was something that lived before, and and there's no uh, relationship. We get inspired by it, but there's there's no relation to what we do now, um, and. Uh, when we were interviewing Yen Kami at the at the Cronin uh, Observatory, um, all of you guys who are who are at Weston, this is a um, a real treasure trove that you have on campus. Uh, he was introducing us to a variety of different instruments, and one of it was this instrument, which uh, essentially is called the um, I'm going to try to get this right, right? So, Sotolunium, uh, which is you know just a very simple classroom demonstration piece for uh, the the moon phases, right? And so, um, it's not that ancient, you know. It's, I think it was in the 1940s, but it's something that you can really um, just go play around with. And and the Cronium Observatory is great also because they have it all um, in situ, you know, all the furniture apparently is from that time as well, so it's fantastic. Uh, so feel free to go and, you know, that's, that's my plug. Jens interview with us was amazing as well. He's such an inspiring guy, um, but it's closer than you think guys. I will just quickly plug the fact that uh, Bettina is going to be running a moon crater drawing workshop at the Cronin Observatory on October 21st, which just happens to be International Observe the Moon Day, which we literally did not even try <laughs> to schedule. <laughs> that was just a day that was suggested to us, and it turned out to be International Observe the Moon Day. So it will be a busy day when we do the... Uh, when we do the workshops. There is uh, another question that I would like to get to. This is from Anna Dredge to everyone. Do you have any broad advice for indigenous artists or other artists who have interest in developing more reciprocal relationships with scientists, engineers, et cetera, to both expand our work as well as potentially offer slash share our unique worldview in connection to our respective cultures? And you're all muted, just to remind you. Um, Joel, I know you can't really speak to the indigenous end of things, but um, do you have any sort of thoughts um, or anything that you could contribute to that? 
Yeah, I mean, and and I think that's something that Bettina has, has has mentioned before, and I think setting the stage right that there are differences in communication, uh, there are differences in process, differences in 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 the way we get things done. Um, but it, you know, establishing a, a zone of of mutual respect um, and and appreciating the kinds of experiences uh, that. Uh, you know, both both artists, I guess, and scientists have um, is is the first way to go. I, you know, and 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 just to to reiterate one of the points that she was making also is that like um, sometimes locating what the big questions are in the science is a way that the artists um, can really help because then you don't really see yourselves as scientists and artists. It's not really about methodology anymore. It's really just about like being human. Um, um, and I'm sure everyone has has had that experience already. You know, you have a couple of drinks with with a scientist or engineer, and like they don't really think that much about how do you build the next satellite. You know, they're thinking about why do you build that satellite now, and and who's going to go up with you if you want to go there. I mean, are, what happens when you die on Mars? You know, are there are there burial rituals there? You know, things like that. You know, like um, that we can all talk about as humans. Yeah, and I don't know where you are, Anna. Um... I don't know if you're if you're still there and if you want to just let me know sort of where you are um, if you're here in London or elsewhere. But I will say that um, I have found that the engineers and scientists at Western are actually quite open minded and open to collaboration and also to um, oh so you're in Ottawa. I I'm gonna I think it's probably likely that it's the same the same there. Um, you know, most of the people that um, that I've engaged with are actually quite open to indigenous worldviews and the idea of, um, you know, indigenous knowledge as a form of science. Um, so I, you know, I think that um, if there is a particular area that you were willing to or that you were interested in um, exploring. Yeah, I, I you know, I, I honestly feel like sometimes you just have to make that first make that first step. Um, okay, so it is just after nine. Uh, Jesse has been a trooper, but he is he has gone. <laughs> um, and so now it's just us stragglers who are left. So I think that um, I am going to draw this to a close. Uh, I would like to thank all of my wonderful panelists for being absolutely brilliant and engaging and discussing um, discussing their work in, in such a, a, a profound sort of way. And uh, this has been a, a superb, superb conversation. Um, just I, noticed a few little extra comments coming in, but it's mostly people saying thank you and goodbye. Uh, so I'm going to let Camille and Joel and Bettina say goodbye. And then, um, Liza, you can um, address your students and do whatever it is you've got to do for the next little while. Thanks, Helen. Uh, first, before everyone goes, I just want to, again, like to reiterate the thanks. Uh, I really enjoyed all of your presentations. I was really struck by, you know, the the research that goes into everything and the, the emphasis on research uh, in process and how that really speaks to sort of like dematerialization and um, sustainable practices and approaches to materials. And I, yeah, I just, again, I really appreciated uh, you spending the time with us. And also thank you to Helen for moderating everything and for partnering with us again on this talk. It's always really great to do that. Um, so thank you, Helen. And again, thank you to everyone here tonight. Uh, and I'm going to just, I'll give everyone a chance to leave from the public. And then I have a couple just quick announcements for the Art Now class. <laughs>